It's no secret that animation is really going through it right now. Between Netflix's decimation of its barely used in-house animation studio and Warner Bros. Discovery's cancellation of 38, yes, 38 animated series through Zaslav's reign of terror, animation is getting shafted left and right, which really sucks. To me, it felt like we've been on the precipice of an animation revolution, a place where cartoons can continue to evolve and flourish into new genres and tones, and the way the medium has been treated recently is obviously a major setback. But despite these discouraging trends, there are reasons to be optimistic. Between successes like Primal, Invincible, and Arcane, it's clear there is an appetite for adult animation that expands beyond the comedy genre. And yet somehow, another incredible series making these strides flew under my radar. What if I told you that AMC Plus Plus streams an hour-long adult animated sci-fi drama, and that it's one of the best series I've seen in the past few years. Well, it's called Pantheon, and it rules. I am incredibly grateful to fellow creator Cape Joel for bringing the series Pantheon to my attention and collaborating with me on the script. The first section of this video will have more minor spoilers and is going to go over the broad strokes of the series, so you can get an idea if it's something you want to check out. But we will warn you when we start to get into major spoiler territory. Pantheon is truly a special series. Produced by Chris Pronosky, a man with some of the best cancelled before their time animated series under his belt, including Motor City, The Midnight Gospel, and Moonbeam City, you can understand both our excitement and concern. Fortunately, Pantheon was picked up for two seasons right off the bat, and they're hard at work animating season two as we speak, but I think the show is going to need a lot more attention if they hope to produce any additional episodes. Pantheon is based on a series of short stories from Hugo Award-winning science fiction and fantasy writer Ken Liu. In fact, if you're a fan of Love, Death, and Robots, then you've already seen some of his work adapted in the short Good Hunting. The series is run by Craig Silverstein and is his first real foray into the world of animation, after working on series like The Dead Zone and cult classic Nikita. The broad strokes of the series are focused on a major Silicon Valley conspiracy involving uploaded intelligences, a step beyond AI in the sci-fi world, basically real people's consciousnesses being uploaded and run on computer servers. And if you're getting Westworld, Matrix, or cyberpunk-like vibes, then that's a good thing, because that's very much the realm in which the series lives and breathes. A bit ironic since UIs don't breathe. But AI theory, overcoming death via science, the ethics of these kinds of technologies, and the corporate greed that goes along with them, these are the kinds of things that the series touches on. Pantheon's voice cast is also a super star-studded affair with performers like Paul Dano, Aaron Eckhart, Taylor Schilling, as well as the late great William Hurt, who plays a very clear Steve Jobs analog right down to the turtleneck and lavish TED Talks. But the real show stealer is Daniel Day Kim, who's just one of those actors who's been good for so long in so many different types of projects be it TV, movies, or even video games. And here, he gets a particularly meaty role as a loving father and brilliant scientist named David, who is stricken with cancer, but is given the chance to upload his consciousness to help propel the technology forward, and possibly live forever, in a manner of speaking. But through this technology, he effectively becomes one of the first of a new race of beings who can interface and control technology on a truly godlike level. Pantheon asks a lot of very heady questions about technology and the nature of the human soul. Again, stuff you're probably used to hearing by now in a post-Matrix world, but the extra dimension Pantheon adds is by really playing up the family aspect. David's UI existence is met with a myriad of reactions. While his former employer simply wants to exploit him, his troubled daughter Maddie is overjoyed that her father is still quote-unquote alive. His wife, however, struggles immensely to accept this new version of the man she loved and questions whether it's the same man or something else entirely. And the show treats both reactions as completely valid given the complexity of the situation. The other primary focus is a teenager named Caspian, played by the incomparable Paul Dano. Caspian is an incredibly smart and successful hacker who slowly starts to become suspicious of his parents' role in his life. He works to uncover some terrifying truths about the nature of his own existence. Then you've got Dr. Chanda, an ambitious futurist who is forced to learn firsthand about all the evil and murderous tactics his own company are using to further their research into UI before their competition can beat them to it. This storyline offers a truly horrifying and topical look into how megacorporations would happily keep their employees working for them long after they died if only the tech was there for them to exploit. But the show isn't just able to play up the drama in an effective way. Through its portrayal of the digital landscape, they're able to showcase some absolutely incredible visuals, as well as some wildly imaginative action sequences. Just about anything is possible. Now that's not to say Pantheon is all dystopian tech thriller. Quite the opposite. I 
I was really drawn to the warmer and more personal stories the series seeks to showcase. At its heart, it's a story about the things that people will do for just a little bit more time with the people they love most. Maddie loves her father so much, and David is willing to move heaven and earth if it means being with his family again, even if that also means having to come to terms with the fact that his body is gone and his wife has moved on. The show can also be surprisingly funny as well. Maud Apatow, daughter of famous comedian and director Judd Apatow, gives a wonderful deadpan performance as an upperclassman named Justine, with whom Maddie forms an unlikely friendship while trying to unravel the mystery of her father's return. The other really noteworthy thing about Pantheon that sticks out to me is that it's a modern show about the internet age, where they actually seem to understand how the internet works. You know what I mean when you watch a movie or show about hackers and it's all over the top and characters use made up words or use real terms incorrectly? Pantheon doesn't do any of that. It's science fiction with an accurate eye on science. As well as also showcasing the darker sides of our current technological age, Maddie is cyberbullied by her classmates early on, Caspian is a frequenter of image boards that look a hell of a lot like very real world ones, the big tech giants keep trying to undercut each other for profit, even if it means hurting everyday people, or how once new technological advancements are made, they're impossible to stop the march of progress. In fact, there's an expertly done scene where we as the viewer get to see all the hard work that goes into building and maintaining a server farm. This scene is set to the song Mr. Roboto, in case you were wondering. The series uses a shocking number of well-known and likely very expensive songs in its soundtrack, including my favorite song of all time, This Must Be The Place by Talking Heads. Pantheon also tackles many themes of conspiracy culture and corporate espionage. In fact, there's a great scene early on where David tries to teach his daughter to always fact check herself and try to find the objective truth. Maddie's idea of the truth will end up being challenged a ton as the series goes on, and she learns more and more dark secrets about the world around her, as well as the high price that is often paid for those who try to tell inconvenient truths. This is where the minor spoilers are going to end. We'll be diving into some much bigger plot points and reveals from here on out, so if the series interests you, please go check it out on either AMC Plus or the streaming service High Dive. It is well worth your attention, and I would love for the series to extend beyond its two-season order. All right, major spoilers ahead. Caspian story has some of the most dramatic twists and turns of the series, and I anticipate will be vitally important moving forward. He discovers that his entire life has been puppeteered by a tech company called Logarithms. As he slowly uncovers the truth, he learns that everything in his life has been coordinated, down to his parents being actors who work at Logarithms. As he falls deeper down the rabbit hole, he discovers that he is, in fact, a clone of the late Stephen Holstrom, Logarithms' founder who tried desperately to perfect UI technology before his death. The lengths they went to in ensure Caspian's development matched Stevens is intense, using company employees to not only act as Caspian's parents, but stage domestic disputes and abuse at the exact same age where Steven himself experienced this with his own parents. It's next level manipulation. Dr. Shonda is a morally complex character as well, who starts out worlds away from the other UI beings like David. Over the course of the show, we learn about his childhood spent dealing with the feelings of unchecked anger. While David wants to try to live in peace with the rest of humanity like his wife and daughter, Chanda fears that once the rest of the world learns about UIs, they would never be safe unless they offered up a showing of brute strength. Think of him as the wannabe Magneto to UI's new race beings. That story also takes on a whole other fascinating layer when we see the man acting as Caspian's abusive father actually has doubts about what they're doing and wants to try and help Caspian break free even though he knows doing so would put all of their lives at risk. While his fake loving mom is much more cultishly devoted to this strange cause, it's a very smart and well-constructed side plot that could easily have been an entire show unto itself, but here in Pantheon it serves as just one piece of a bigger narrative puzzle. And even when the truth of the UIs is ultimately outed to the rest of the world, people still don't know what to believe, and many just happen to cling to whatever conspiracy theory is most comfortable for them. Some people even want to embrace the idea of UI, despite its massive implications for the future of the world. Again, just another dark specter of the internet age we live in, and Pantheon is all too happy to remind us about it. But of course, none of this answers the question you still might be asking, and that is, why is the show called Pantheon? Well, the idea seems to be that these new UI beings are poised to become the new gods of a modern technological age. And I mean, yeah, they're ageless, formless, they have powers far beyond that of mortals, Sounds like godhood to me. These powers really get put to the test in some of the show's amazing action sequences. The animators really take full advantage of the idea that the UIs think three-dimensionally. When they fight, they don't need to take any of our world's physics into account. A lot of these big battles also take place within a world of Warcraft-like video game called Winds of Winter, meaning that this tech thriller is also free to occasionally dip its toes into high fantasy with swords, spears, and magic spells standing in for code. And with any story about gods also comes very hard questions about fate 
faith and especially what it means to be faithful. You see as the show goes on that we begin to truly realize what Julius Pope, the head of logarithms, actually wants from Caspian and UIs. To make the Christian allegories a little more explicit, the guy who is left in charge of this technological quote-unquote church is literally named Pope, and he's hoping to help facilitate the literal second coming of their leader, Stephen Holstrom. Seems pretty deliberate. Pantheon also reminds us in the first few minutes of episode 1 that most god pantheons that we know from mythology exist as a result of death and bloodshed, be it Zeus killing his father Cronus and many other instances of deicide. But there are major issues with UI that have to be worked out, namely a fatal flaw that effectively deteriorates each UI the longer it exists. A flaw that not even Stephen Holstrom could solve while he was alive, leading to his choice to create a genetic copy of himself instead of becoming a UI. A copy that might be able to live long enough to solve the flaw and and usher in a new UI age properly. Which is an idea that becomes all the more fascinating when we remember the second generation of UIs that is teased near the end of the season is very, very different from the compassionate learned scientist types that are David and the others. We see a terminal American astronaut trying to beat the clock that is death and have her life mean something more, as well as the implication of an Israeli Mossad member getting their mind uploaded, which I think could lead to some very fascinating brains vs. brawn scenarios in season 2. Season 1 also ends on a major cliffhanger where to limit the UI's power and slow down the UI arms race between nations, Logarithms basically shuts off internet access to the entire world. Meaning that by the time we tune back into the show next season, there's no telling what the world will look like. Did people thrive and come closer together like many of our real world commentators seem to think could happen? Or will the world descend into anarchy like in Mitchells vs. the Machines? If Caspian really is a genetic copy of Stephen Holstrom, who was forced to live his life as closely as possible to the original, does that mean one day he could get sick with the same disease that killed Holstrom? Religion and mythology sure do love symmetry and irony after all. Look, Pantheon is so damn cool. It's super creative and a real high-minded animated series that not enough people are talking about. If any of this interests you, I am begging you to go check it out. Show that there's an appetite for adult animation to expand beyond the comedy genre and support shows that are not only trying to propel the medium forward, but doing so with incredible storytelling. Don't let these corporate mergers and streaming services pour to decisions continue to cut animation off at the knees. Thank you for listening, and huge thanks to Cape Joel for collaborating with me on this script. Please check out his comic book focused channel. There's a link in the description. Peace. Johnny! 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 Johnny!